Hey everyone, welcome back to the Residency Collab Specialty Series. I have Dr. Gottwald here in her second part of this two-part series for anesthesiology residents specifically. Dr. Gottwald is going to talk about her interviewing tips that she um, has for all of you guys in this video. It's a little bit of a long video, but there's amazing advice on there, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Feel free to reach out if you have more questions. Thank you so much for coming back. You've given great advice for you know the entire application part and honestly how people can start prepping from MS3 year and onwards if they're interested in anesthesiology. So let's get right into the interviewing experiences. I First question, so I know I, I always put this here and it's never any pressure <laughs> for you yeah, to sure. say, you know, because it's personal information, it's really up to your discretion. So, but thank you so much for writing the information here and I love that people can sort of follow along. So, you know, take it away. Uh, let us know yeah. just how the interview experience was for you. Yeah, so as far as how many interviews I got, I did have six anesthesia interviews and two prelim interviews. Awesome. I also had one IM interview. interviewed at the place I did um, my IM core at, just as like an ultimate backup. Um, I kind of knew that I would get an interview there if I really wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so I did go to that. As far as my interviews, I was like a little bit disappointed with how many interviews I got. Although everyone else that I know that applied anesthesia as an IMG was at the same or less interviews this season. Right. Um, for reference, my scores were my step one was high 230s and my CK was high 240s. Yeah. So I think truly with any... Um, Which is amazing student, scores. Yeah. Cool. I, I think with any US student would have had probably double the interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also this year was 2020 was the year of the MDDO merger for residency programs right. and I did learn that like some extreme number like 20 of 25 don't quote me on that <laughs> solely DO programs were no longer continuing to take an incoming class for anesthesia so mm -hmm. that decreased the number of DO programs available and I think that DOs and IMGs especially crib U.S. Canadian students are kind of on the same level as far as some uh, stigma they face, right? And right. maybe maybe a less desirable applicant. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there was more competition between um, U.S. IMGs and DOs for this cycle because of the lack of DO programs and the merger this year. So right. um, that may change if more programs open up or more spots open up. But that was what I ended up with. So Still match. In a great program and categorical so congratulations right. again yeah um so yeah let us know like sort of just how your interview process because the trajectory for everybody is so different everybody always right. feels like they should be following you know like they should get an interview the next day but yeah just explain to us like how your sort of experience went with the the process or this of the entire season right so anesthesia is kind of noted as like a later season um, specialty. Yeah. There were people that were getting interviews like within the week of ERAS submitted and anesthesia to my knowledge was not one of those. Mm -hmm. I did not get an interview offer until like mid to late October. So that was like a month after ERAS was submitted until right. I heard anything. Right. So and from a couple people that had matched anesthesia the year before from my school that I had just like reached out to ask, they said that's the same that they experienced as well. So I didn't have my first interview until November, and then my last interview was mid-January. I had one in January. The rest were all in November and December. What's your overall advice um, for um, applicants that are going to go into interviews for anesthesiology? So uh, le number one, I said be yourself as hard as it is. I think we all kind of uh, enter interview season like trying to be professional, and it's kind of like stiff and you know like mm -hmm. especially in anesthesia I find most anesthesiologists are pretty down to earth it's kind of known for like them to be more relaxed a little more chill um it's kind of rare to find a really uptight anesthesiologist I think at least from mm -hmm. what I've experienced and heard so it's a, like okay to be yourself second tip would be try to find one to two things about yourself that are unique to you to include mm -hmm. in your hobbies uh, like I said in, in video one and the first part of this, I got asked every single interview about powerlifting. It was like the first hobby I wrote down. Every every single interview they asked me about it. So find something unique to you. And generally, if you love to do it, it's really easy to talk about. So yeah. why people should not lie. Yeah, don't lie. Number one, <laughs> don't, don't lie. lie and say you do something that you really right. don't because right. you will get asked about it. Exactly. Um, number three, have rehearsed 
a few answers for the question why your specialty that's definitely the most asked question like people want to know why do you want to do this are you a good fit for this are you in this for the wrong reasons mm-hmm. um I ended up kind of learning along my uh, interview trail that anesthesia is often a backup for people with really competitive specialties like plastics and derm and ortho, stuff like that. That's really competitive for anybody. I learned that anesthesia is often a backup. So some people come in not even really wanting to do anesthesia and then it's like there ends up being their backup specialty. So uh, if this is generally what you want to do, you can have a few questions rehearsed for why your specialty and the book the successful match which i mentioned also in the first video that has a ton of bullet points that are like positives about the specialty and like one is like get to work with your hands minimal charting you know like stuff like that right um you get to focus on one patient at a time in the or generally if unless you're doing icu or something it's different but in the or you focus on one patient at a time stuff like that they have a whole list which is really great to include in your personal statement if you're kind of trying to find the words to say why you like it. Um, And then I also read those bullets before every interview, like, all right, they asked me this, I got have like three things that I can like rattle off about anesthesia that sounds sincere. I had an anesthesiologist tell me don't say you love to be in the OR. Because (laughs) everyone likes to be in the OR. Not not everyone. But like anybody that's in the specialty likes to be in the OR. Right. And don't say you like to work with your hands. Is what he said. He's like, find something more intricate like you love pharmacology and the mix of phys and farm that is anesthesia so right. which is true right so find something different to say because that's the thing that's going to make you stand out and the, then the things that make you stand out is what people will remember when they're exactly. ranking you when they're you know thinking and talking to your team because we all know everybody debriefs on all the candidates you know and if you want to have positive things for them to say be like oh yeah she mentioned this in her interview and truly like and like I said, find things that are not generic, but mm-hmm. then also things you still like. Like, I really like the mix of farm and fizz. If you're going into anesthesia and you don't really like farm, I don't know how that's going to work for you. Cause it's really farm-based, so I like farm. Um, and so I was really, like, confidently able to say that. Number four is psych yourself up. Imposter <laughs> syndrome is real, especially when you're at IMG and you're in uh-huh. a room with other U.S. students. Mm-hmm. I remember being at I think one or two interviews and I was the only IMG. The rest were all US people. And I was like, everyone's like, oh, where do you go to school? And I'm like, the Caribbean. <laughs> like, you know, you get so nervous. And it's nerve wracking. Yeah. Yeah. And your entire med school experience, although you are an equal because you have passed the same examinations as they have, mm-hmm. you still will feel this need to prove yourself or yeah. this feeling like you're, you know, less than because you've kind of been told by a lot of programs that you are and you're not. Yeah. If you got an interview, you deserve to be there. People don't interview you if you don't deserve it. 100%. Got to own up to who you are. Like, this is the time for you. And I say this so much, but I, because I can't just can't say it in any other way. This is the time for you to shine. You know, you've put exactly. in so many years, years of your life, you know, from undergrad to med school to be here. So own it up. Like, you know, soak up that moment and just give them the give your best shot. So And then number five would be read the room and remember you're always being watched. Mm-hmm. So Goodness there are, yourself. yeah, so there are some threads on um, Reddit about strange interactions at interviews when you need to stand out in your interview you don't yeah. need to stand out when you're chilling with all the candidates like that you, you don't want to be that yeah. candidate you don't you really don't <laughs> even tours and break time it's really not the time to just relax and start you know completely letting exactly. off guards no you, you still got to be somewhat professional yeah you may not have to Agreed. be as formal to the exactly. resident as a PD, but still have certain level of boundary, like respectful yeah. boundary. But I love this. Like, like really read the room, man. Always being watched. Yeah. If you have someone that's escorting you to the interview and you have a different person bringing you back to the interview and you have different person bringing you lunch, like mm-hmm. say thank you, say good morning, yeah. be nice. Yeah. Know that everybody is paying attention and anybody has the ability to impact your uh, potential chances at matching there, right? Oh, that person was rude to me in the elevator. That person was rude to me in the hallway. Like, yeah. don't take them. No, I yeah. agree. This kind of makes sense, right? Like training to be a physician in the future. As a physician, your image is changed for society. People will always watch you. You know, you watch and or seen a different limelight. 
compared exactly. to a lot of the general public. So it makes sense for you to practice these things now, no matter I where agree. you go in the future as a physician, you have to read the room. You have to understand, you know, yeah. where your social etiquette, like it's just, it's just the right time to start practicing th these things already. If you yeah. don't aren't aware of it, you know? Yeah. And if social yeah. etiquette and politeness was not, is not your forte now, mm -hmm. like you patients are going to dish it out to you as soon as you pull that on them. So just improve your personal skills for real if it's if you need to yeah so how did you go about preparing for your interview season uh so like i said the successful match and i'm really helpful and the beginning chapters are all about pre and post communication things to put in eras things not to put in eras how to say thank you things not to do all these kinds of things um and then for they provide classic interview questions I also ended up reading, I think it was on AAMC, posts a few practice residency questions. Yeah. I don't remember where the exact location was. I think I just Googled like I residency, know. MD residency, common interview questions or something. Yeah. And I just looked at those beforehand. It was maybe like 50 questions or so, maybe even less. And I just ran through them and was like trying to think of things that I could have for an answer for those, even if I didn't... Um, have somebody I didn't have anybody like read them to me and me recite them mm -hmm. I just like bullet point thought in my head if they ask me this what's I know what to say answer, this this and this yeah. yeah in this book too in the specific chapter for anesthesia they have common questions um for each specialty and then also have things like I said positives about the specialty that you can always integrate into your interview question your answers right makes sense so, so just bouncing off of that what were your most asked questions overall so definitely number one was why anesthesia? Like I mentioned in the first video, not every med student gets exposure to anesthesia and they kind of want to see why you want to do this specialty, especially if you didn't have exposure. You know, it's like, would you want to do IM if you never got to experience IM? Maybe, maybe not. Would you truly know what happens in IM? Right. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and then Second was give an example of when you saw anesthesia in action. So I definitely had multiple questions uh, about that, about patients and anesthesia. Um, some would just straight up, did you get to intubate on your rotations? Did you get a chance to actually do stuff? Luckily, I did get to do lots of intubations on my rotations. So, Actually, um, really quickly bouncing off that, if, if let's say there is, there's a student at an interview and that question was asked, right? Like, did you get exposure to blah, blah, blah? and they didn't have that exposure, what do you think, in your opinion, would be the best way to answer that question? Because that could be a difficult question for some people. Sure. So I think if I, let's say I were to ask these questions to someone who did not have any experience, and they said, why anesthesia? Right. You should still know the fundamentals of anesthesia, right? Pharmacology, right. you manipulate physiology with pharmacology. Right. And you get to keep the patient safe and alive during anesthesia. Without you, you cannot provide any surgical services at all. So those are things that you could say, why anesthesia? Um, if you didn't get any exposure, you could say, unfortunately, I was not able to schedule an elective rotation. I tried really hard to, and mm -hmm. because of some circumstances, it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. But I did seek out anesthesia exposure, specifically on my surgery rotation. I showed up early for cases. I contacted mm -hmm. the anesthesiologist during my rotation and said, can I just come shadow you in the mornings before the case? Can you show me how you set up the OR? Things like that. Um, they just want to kind of see that you've gotten immersed. Um, and give me an example when you saw anesthesia in action. Um, one would be, I think I mentioned this in the first video, is like a, a code. Yeah. Um, so usually they call in uh, the code team and usually an anesthesiologist comes in to tube the patient if the code continues for long enough. Right. Um, and so you could say, yeah, I was able to watch a code, even if you didn't get to participate, like you didn't get to perform compressions. Sometimes you just, as a student, you just get pushed in the corner during the right. code, which is okay. Right. Um, you could say, I witnessed a code. Um, we had too many people in the room. I was not able to, um, to help, but I got to watch the anesthesiologist like step in, take over the code, run the code, put the tube in, bag the patient, whatever. Like you could say, I got to see the anesthesiologist do this. Right. And because I saw this, it made me want to be the person, the go-to person, the person to call the airway specialist, you know, whatever you want to say about awesome. that. So no, that's that like 
everything you said there, I think people should be taking notes um, because I think yeah. it's great. Like even the way you communicated that so beautifully well. Yeah. So you. in terms of your difficult questions then, how did you tackle those and sort of, what did you have? Cause these, these ones I love asking people just to know, like, you know, like what were you asked? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I really only had one difficult question. Okay. Um, and it was some guy who asked me, if I had ever participated in a code and I was like, yeah, I participated in like, I got to be in on a code. And what actually happened was the patient was like 89 years old. She was super frail. Her parents or her parents, her family had just had a discussion about DNR. They like were in the room talking about DNR for her. And then she coded like within half an hour of having this discussion. Like I kid you not. Yeah. Family's freaking out. They leave. And they start the code, her ribs start all cracking, you know how it goes. Yeah. I put on gloves like in rotation to like um in rotation to step in for compressions. Yeah. And the family is hysterical outside. And they send in a nurse and say, just stop the code. We don't want to do this. We just had a discussion about DNR. We don't want her to have to uh recover from this because we don't know if she will it was incredibly she was in like i think um, end stage renal disease as well so her prognosis was not very good even for you know for an elderly person right and right. so i remember he this isn't that's not traditionally how a code works right so traditionally the the family doesn't get to come in and say stop the code i don't right. want this anymore exactly. uh-huh. so that's not how it works right um usually and I f- ended up fumbling on the details of this code because he was like, well, did they intubate the patient? And I was like, no, oh, so not you, that I... Your interviewer was asking like specifics. Like he was yes. no, oh, okay. Right. And so I was like, I had the gloves on. This was my first code. I was like nervous. And I was like trying to like absorb everything going around me. And I was like, <laughs> I don't think that they intubated her. He's like, well, why not? If the code went on for so long, she should have been intubated. I was like, long story about the DNR discussion, whatever and this was in a small community hospital and this interviewer was from a big inner city hospital. So I think difficult to connect. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. not, it's not the same. So right. he was asking me like specific questions and he's like, okay, well they didn't intubate her, but why? And I tried right. to explain that this community <laughs> hospital experience was, that's right. why. Um, right. And then he's like, proceeded to ask me in-depth questions about CPR. He's like, so how do you know when circulation has been restored? and like so asking me like too. yeah he ended up like yeah he ended up like pimping yeah. me after i had kind of already fumbled on the details of this so he's like did you really have to, were you really in on this code whatever <laughs> so i just like i just hung in there the best we could i was like you know what i'm to be honest i was so nervous it was my first code i yeah. had never seen a person code and yeah. i was like i may be mixing some of the details up to be honest like i, I was really nervous but i was there I, I watched you were happen, genuine so. about your story yeah your exactly so that, like you didn't just and I mean this I've seen this happen because I had a group interview once and um like when when someone gets asked a nervous like a you know a tough question and you get nervous don't make things up that weren't true just to exactly. make it sound better because you're not doing yourself a great deed there you exactly. know exactly what happened like and you know what people trust me like when you're saying your story and you felt like you didn't do enough like for example your code story right I also was asked a similar questions about a tough thing but it's like I didn't really do anything in that tough situation I was just sort of in the background watching and it may seem to you like you're saying like you didn't do much but just say the truth because they know you're medical students everybody knows like we're really at the bottom of the tiers yeah. so your exposure and your experience can just be you standing on the side exactly but exactly and like, it. like don't go in and be like I started into baby you know yeah. I mean? like, <laughs> Yeah, for real. They're like, we know yeah. that you guys get pushed to the walls and you're just like, or we kick you out of the room once exactly. there's too many people. Like they know and they know when you're making it up. Like just <laughs> Exactly. You don't want to be caught like, you know, in your own lie. That's such a red flag. And, yeah, for real. Uh, it's better to say the truth, be like, you know, I didn't do anything, but I watched it and that was great experience, you know? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, and, and basically they want to know how jarred are you going to be the first time you see a code happen or the first few times? Like, right. have you had any exposure? Are you going to go faint in the hallway when you see somebody crash for the first time? And you know, uh, yeah, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, they know um, you didn't deliver the child by yourself. Like you're fine. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. okay to say you're not an expert yet. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, that's so um, good. But I love that then, you ended up matching this. Program. I did. 
I did. Like, what are the chances, man? I was like, it was my second of three interviews. Right. And I ended up, I like came out, we moved to a different topic after that. And he asked me about, again, about the hurricane. <laughs> I ended up talking about that again. Everyone's very intrigued about living through a hurricane. Right. Um, but he ended up, and he ended up like laughing in the end. And I think I ended on a good note, but I came right. out and I was like, wow, I just bombed that. This is my <laughs> top program right now. I'm like, like get it together for the last ones. Just like um, I added on the on the bottom half of this paragraph too, I said, and it's okay when they ask you tough questions to take yes. a second and think. Yes. The time will feel like hours to you when really it's only probably like five to 10 seconds. They know exactly what they're doing when they hit you with a hard question, right? It's intentional. They're yeah. trying to see how you react. Right. And the point is to see, are you gonna be the person who takes a couple seconds to regroup or are you going to be the one who panics and lies yeah. so like what impression <laughs> you want to leave <laughs> exactly like nobody's going to fault you for taking a few seconds to think about a hard question there's just something really good there is that it's you know when you usually come out of an interview and even if you think that man that sucked don't be too hard on yourself because maybe for the interviewer you were okay you know yeah. we always tend to be hypercritical about ourselves so just know that you did your best, take a breath and just, you know, move on to the next. Don't let that exactly. one interview affect, you know, your entire interview cycle or, you know, the next couple of interviews you have coming up. Just, just really yeah. like take a deep breath and just move on. Exactly. And for some too, some interviews that I had, it was like, I went from one room to the next room to the next room yeah. to the next room and like yeah. interviewed back to back to back. Sometimes you have a break in between, sometimes you don't. So if you end up making a mistake, you got to, you have to move over it quickly and just yeah. like. On to the next one. They're probably the next one's probably not going to ask you the same questions, right? They usually each have certain questions they're supposed to ask. So, yeah. chances are you're not going to get another crappy question like that from the next one. So, yeah. Or even if you do, same thing. Just exactly. <laughs> Just roll with the punches. It's okay. roll with the punch. Exactly. Couldn't have better, said it better myself. Awesome. So then, in terms of your interview days and tours, to be honest, it kind of ends up all blending into the same thing by the end you'll end up going on a few interviews and you're like okay the tour again same thing <laughs> right. um for anesthesia specifically it's nice to see the ors if they let you just to like see what you're getting into um mm -hmm. the hospital i matched at i was pleasantly surprised to see everything was super updated um and sometimes places are still paper charting anesthesia which mm -hmm. is kind of an old practice, but I mean, not everybody's equipped with the same stuff. Um, right. Now in updated hospitals, basically you have blood pressure cuff and the EKG leads on the patient and it will track the data into the computer for you. So you don't have to hand chart. You just like click on the computer when you give a drug, or when you change something, you like just chart that you did that. But as far as all the numbers go, as far as blood pressure and heart rate and EKG, that's all charted for you into the computer yeah. already. So um, I rotated at a hospital that still did paper charting. I think almost all my other programs did computer charting. So it'll just give you an idea of how updated it is. Another thing I asked were like, were meals provided or not? Basically like, am I gonna have to pay for my food out of my own pocket when I'm here for 14 hours a day? Or am I gonna, you know, bring food? Right. Yeah. Another thing would be, is parking provided or not? That's more of an issue in inner city, obviously, because parking can be really expensive. Are you going to have to take public transit in? Um, if this is a place where you have a car, are they going to have parking for you? Do you have to pay for it? Whatever. Um, another thing was what area of the city do most residents live in? Again, if you're in an inner city, yeah, it's good to know. Yeah, it's good to know where places to avoid, places that you can stay, especially as females. We experience a lot more difficulty with safety as far as getting to and from work. As much as I hate to say it, that's just the way life is right now. So yeah. that was important to me was to live somewhere safe. An average number of hours worked per week. Um, in residency, it's pretty brutal. But there were like a couple programs that specifically said to me, our residents work fewer hours than most residents. Okay. And to be completely frank, like my quality of life is still important to me. And Very much. The, yeah, in the era of burnout and physician exhaustion so mm -hmm. not that I would not that I would pick a place just because it works less hours but it's definitely a pro on my list when I'm when I'm making um my final lists right yeah so, 
And if you have to prioritize different things, right? I feel exactly. like you should never feel bad about what you're prioritizing. No, I mean, I did never. the same, you know, I prioritized, you know, um, that lifestyle. Like, is it going to be close to certain things? Is it inner city or not? You know, so everyone's going to have different things to prioritize. So never, um, like I, I've given this advice to people, just don't feel bad about what you prioritize. Your rank list is your rank list for a reason. Yeah, exactly. It's and really it's, up to you what's yeah. important and what's not. Yeah. And it comes for other students who have families and spouses and, you know, like other people are factors into the picture have entirely different priorities. And exactly. they're who like who I talk to on the interview trailer, like, oh, I picked this place, but it's too expensive for a whole family to live right now. So I'm taking this place, you know, like everybody is different and right. you should never feel guilty or bad about something you think is important. Hundred. Definitely don't express that in an interview that <laughs> I want this place because we work less hours. Don't right. say that. Yeah. But it's something you can consider on your own. So yeah, tours are ways for you because um, usually it's residents giving. It's just a way for you to get information. Uh, one right. more thing I did want to add for you know just advice for everybody. It, it's sort of stuff we've talked about before earlier in this video. Is tours are really not the place for you to you know you're not getting interviewed on the tour. You don't right. need to start being lied to 35 research papers. Okay, like this is time for you to ask questions, for you to know, is this going to be a good fit for you? Because you have to evaluate that simultaneously while you are being evaluated. So, right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Tours are very relaxed. The residents, almost every tour went on, residents were like, now's the time to ask me questions yeah. that you don't want to ask the PD yeah. and you don't want to ask everyone else. Like ask me and yeah. Keep it professional and ask professional questions, but don't be afraid to ask questions like, on average, how many hours a week do you guys actually right. work? Yeah. Uh, what time do you actually come in in the morning? Yeah. Like, what, how is your relationship your with other people, faculty, and things like that? Right. Such right. important questions. Yeah. yeah, and it's not fair to peg those questions on PDs because they're also think they're trying to sell their program to you at the same time as you're trying to decide if it's a right fit, and so they can't just bash negative parts of their hospital or their program and rightfully so like you shouldn't ever put that pressure on a pd or a faculty member I, to I'm disclose gonna... negatives yeah. but a resident will tell you like this isn't the best you know i wish this was better mm -hmm. but we've made these strides to do this this and this for example the program i'm at on my tour he was like our intern year we do a couple surgery uh, rotations but we've gotten to the point where we got rid of all of surgery call during those rotations so you could take anesthesia call but you don't take surgery call something like that mm -hmm. he's like we made this modification during intern year for our interns because we were finding they're working a ton of hours and it was not beneficial to their edu to their education right. so actually that's a really good point you just made is, is sort of asking these hard questions but also being good with your words and asking don't be like oh what, what's you know crappy about your program like that's such a yeah. terrible way to ask you just be like what are some of the things that your program is working on based on intern feedback does your program yeah. take intern feedback that's so important and this was not listed um anywhere in this doc but at the end of every interview they're going to say do you have any questions and it's commonly noted as i'll add this do, yeah is commonly noted like you should have questions ready for each program and it's hard because a lot of times before you even start interviewing they're going to give you this whole overview big spiel of the program and they'll be like this covers most of your questions and then at the end of the interview with each person they'll be like do you have any questions and you're gonna be like honestly no because you guys covered so yeah. much in your powerpoint before and now you guys cover so much and the residents told me so much Right. Still try to think of a couple of questions that you can ask. Um, I always had like two questions like staged and ready to go. Right. And one was like, one of them in particular was, what do you guys do to support resident mental health and wellness during residency? Sure. And yeah. then you could say, like, could you tell me a little bit more about your program? Or if they don't have a program, be like, do you guys have like therapists available? To residents do you guys have like go-to residents who are yeah. you know, in charge of overseeing resident health something like that right. um, just because that's an important issue to me but also it's really easy to ask about uh, and, agreed. yeah and I think another one was a lot of programs require research mm -hmm. um, which I'm not super into research I don't want to be a researcher mm -hmm. but I know it's required and I know you'll have to go to conferences and it's yeah. just part of it do QI but, and things like that. right exactly so I would ask like who is the appointed person to help us with QI are they actually like 
what kind of resources do they give us? And right. luckily a couple of programs were like, don't worry, we have staff. They basically give yeah. you a list of five things that they think are great and you just run with the project and they do a lot of help for you. Perfect. That's how most of them answered that. But that's another thing is like, how am I even going to go about research as far as somebody who didn't really do research? I did one project in undergrad, but it was an easy question for me to ask. So always have like two or three questions that are like your go-tos that you can just like whip out anytime someone asks you have questions because it shows your interest and you're kind of expected to ask questions. It looks bad if you say, no, yeah. I don't have any questions. Yes, so. yes, I agree. I, and exactly what you just said, even though you're like bombarded with information based on, you know, the dinner, if you had one, the tour, right. the introduction, the, you get so much information, but still ask a question if they ask yeah. you a question. Exactly. At least one. At least, At least one. one. Yeah, exactly. So I think we sort of touched on this already, but how did you communicate with residents um, during the interview days? Uh, just like I said, you know, residents usually were around and said, like, if you have any questions, ask me. Like I said, ask in a polite, professional manner mm -hmm. and realize that they're usually pretty open to, like, telling you what you are really asking for. Right. Um, everyone I interacted with, interacted with was great. Um, and some residents will give out their email address at the end of the interview. Like, and I do think it is appropriate to reach out. All right. And so in terms of communicating with PDs, how did you go about that? So really the only time I communicated with a PD was for post interview communication. Yeah. I did not send an email, like looking forward to my interview with you next week. Like I didn't send anything pre-interview. They know you're coming. Yeah. Yeah. They prep for you. Like they yeah. know exactly like who's going to be there and what days. I don't think that that's necessary. Mm -hmm. I sent every PD an email thanking them for the opportunity to interview afterwards. And in the book, follow a successful up. match. So yeah, have, <laughs> yeah, have a follow up email, mm -hmm. um, preferably within a couple days to a week, I think, because I see so many faces. I think it's the sooner after your interview, the better. Um, but I don't think that you need to communicate with the PD other than that, really. Right. Um, this is unique to my situation. Uh, later on, when I had made my decision, um, I sent the PD a genuine email of interest, telling them that I was extremely interested in your program, loved what I loved what your program offered because of X, Y, and Z. Um, for that, I am uh, really trying to rank, or I'm planning to rank you highly in my list. Right. Again, I appreciate your time. Let me know if you need anything. Yeah. And the PD that I matched, program I matched at was like, Thank you so much for each for your email. I was actually planning on reaching out to you. You were one of our favorite candidates. Oh, yeah, cool. like I think this was a very unique experience. I don't think everyone gets like a love letter back. And these no, are called love letters, by the no, way. No, that's true. Yeah, I, I say this in my other videos. Like, don't be discouraged if you don't get anything back or all you get no, is a thank you. It, it's rare to get that, but I think that's so awesome. Yeah, you were able to get that. Yeah, me and the PD like had a great conversation at my oh, interview and so yeah so he was like you know you're one of our favorite candidates like we'd be so happy to have you on our team please stay in touch with us during the rest of the season whatever yeah and then come february i ended up telling the pd once i had interviewed everything and we were making my list and i was like this is my top program this is where i want to be right i ended up sending the pd a letter and said like to be completely transparent, your program is my number one choice. I would be honored to be a part of your team. I really hope to hear from you. You know, thank you again. It was a great uh, experience interviewing with you guys. Right. And um, he responded, Caitlin, I just wanted to let you know we are planning to rank you very highly. Hope to see you with us next summer. That's Something so like great. That. Good. Disclaimer, disclaimer, do not email every program telling them that through that you're your number one yeah. when you're not. Because yeah. that will turn around and bite you. Like hundred percent. That is so dishonest and just I yeah. think that's like foul play basically because yeah. if you end up at your number three program, eventually it's gonna come out that they were not your number one and you yeah. said that. And there are times in the future for fellowships and things like that. Don't ever make a bad impression on a program because mm -hmm. you just want to lie and get a spot. Like yeah. I say that Absolutely. I said that to the PD of my actual number one and that was it. I did not email anybody else. I did not say anything else to anybody. 
Good. Awesome. A lot of respect from them. And I would not advise anybody to, to do that. Yes. So. Only one program that is your number one should be getting your number one. I mean, I, I just on, on, on the basis of that. So I personally did the same thing. I only sent my first program that they were number one. The other ones, like if I had like my top three, I set the other two, like I'm going to rank you very highly. And I don't like, you know, I'm still very much interested because, you know, the algorithm can go really any way. But exactly. I totally agree. Your number one should be only sent to your number one. Agreed. Yeah. Very much. And I think that's fine to send a couple to your top programs. And, right. And that's it fine. It really depends. Right. And if a program explicitly tells you, don't send us a thank you email, right. nobody's going to read it. Don't send it. Don't send like, it. Just follow the rules and yeah. say what they do because it's probably mm-hmm. going to reflect negatively on you if you're like, oh, I'm going to thank them anyway because it's the right <laughs> thing to do. Like, yeah. it's not. <laughs> so in terms of your pre-interview communication, what did you do? I didn't honestly do anything mm-hmm. much. ERAS will send you a notification or an email when you have an interview offer. But I did have one program that sent me the interview but told me to call to schedule the interview. Programs like to do it differently. Just oblige. Just be. Just do what they tell you yeah, to do. Right. Um, other than that, just be respectful to everyone uh, on the phone too. Like you'll usually be speaking with the coordinator. You won't be speaking with the PD or you know a faculty directly. Schedule on ERAS. Schedule on ERAS. They said to call. Call. Like just yeah. Pretty straightforward. It's yeah. But no, I, I, in terms of your last sentence there. Yeah, I think, and I mentioned this in my email etiquette video. And then in terms of post interview communication, I know we sort of already talked about that, but if you want to elaborate um, anything more. So yeah, I would definitely always advise sending a thank you email. Um, mm-hmm. Some people still do handwritten letters, but right. if I'm sending a letter to a 600 bed hospital like how do I know it's actually going to get to the person I don't know I'm a little bit skeptical of like (laughs) mailing to such a big place so I'm just I just emailed the coordinator and the PD usually if I didn't have the PD email um, then I would just thank the coordinator and say like if you could please pass my regards on to the PD I would greatly appreciate it and usually they'd say yep yep forwarding to the PD thanks for coming in like right as I mentioned here I said try to recall something specific you discussed that was unique to your conversation so they remember you if yeah. you have like some really strange conversation that's not typical interview conversation then I would definitely include that like one of my friends had a huge like movie conversation with one of her interviewers and she yeah. was like, thanks so much for the interview. Really enjoyed talking to you about all these movies. <laughs> and like, that's unique to their interview. Right. right. So that's going to make help stand out and be remembered. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So after I got out of each interview, if I had something quirky like that, I would just like write it down really quick, like right. in a little like notepad, like talked about X, Y, Z. Yeah. So I would remember later because usually your brain's like all over the place on interview day for the first couple at least. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Just say thank you. And, and don't expect an answer either. Like yeah. these people interview hundreds of people, yeah. if not like more. So don't, right. don't be offended with no one emails you back. Definitely. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to add? This is such an exciting time. Like fourth yeah. year was great and it's totally different in the midst of Corona and not having regular elective schedule, but I love fourth year. It was like yeah. interview season was fine. You'll get in a flow. It becomes a fun process. If anybody wants to like contact me with further questions. Awesome. But yeah, no, definitely. I'm going to um, put your um, Insta and whatever social media and your email address so that people and applicants that have, you know, burning questions or just want to reach out to you and get more information and experiences. Cause you're first of all, so wise, you've gone through so much and you know, you have good advice to to give to people. So I'll definitely put um, um, Dr. Gottwald's contact information in the description box below. So be sure to check that out. And if anybody, you know, reaches out to me directly with questions about anesthesiology, I'm just going to go ahead and forward them to you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for being such a good sport. And honestly, the entire collab, this was such a fun collab because I got so much fun. It was good. Yeah, I got so much too. So this is like super, super good advice. And I know um, people can genuinely benefit from this. So thank you again. And if anybody wants to reach out to you, they can do it through me or through you directly. And I'll definitely add all of your uh, information down below. For sure. Thanks for meeting with me. Awesome. Thank you. Bye guys.